Um, Bill mentioned a, a couple of resources. Here's a, a couple of books that I've written that I would recommend to you. The Truth About Children of Divorce costs about 15 bucks uh, in paperback. And um, it's a book really written for parents. Every, it has everything in there for dealing with your own emotions, talking to kids about separation and divorce, suggestions about alternative parenting plans that we'll, we'll get into, um, how to manage new relationships. It's really a practical guide. Uh, it's a resource for parents. It's the sort of book that lots of lawyers will hand out to their clients as they come in the door. Um, it's also, if you're a mental health professional, you might find some of the practical tips and practical language in there helpful for you in terms of using with your clients. Uh, Renegotiating Family Relationships is written for professionals. This is really more of a how-to book. Uh, this is a second edition. Uh, it actually is just off the presses. It was published just in November of 2011, so it's only a couple months old. Um, and that's really, again, a, a how-to-do guide. Um, just to start really basically, for, for those of you who may not be familiar with mediation, I'll call it both custody and divorce mediation, and the distinction I'll, I'll make in just a second. But what a mediator does is do something that, something that many people think is crazy in common sense terms, is just when two people have decided to end their relationship, they can't stand each other, maybe something horrible has happened, like one person has had an affair, um, you sit down in a room with the two people together and say, let's try to work it out, right? Let's not try to work it out in terms of saving your marriage or saving your relationship, but let's try to work it out in terms of the disputes that are arising as a result of the breakdown of your relationship. That's what a mediator does. Um, you may, uh, I, I will meet with parents together. I will meet with parents separately. Sometimes I do some shuttle diplomacy where I'm doing the negotiations with two parents who can't be in the room together. So we'll be going back and forth. Um, mediation is both involves both process and substance. We're going to talk about both today. Um, the, the process, of course, is the negotiation process. The substance has to do with what are the legal disputes that arise in divorce. And those disputes fall into two broad categories. They're issues about children and they're issues about money. So that's the that, that's the basis. This is you'll hear lots of legal terms and so on, but they're familiar to you and they're familiar to parents because this is what parents deal with. More specifically, with children, there is the issue of uh, what's often terms legal and physical custody. Terms vary from state to state, as I already mentioned. Uh, physical custody is a parenting plan; it's the time that you're sharing. Legal custody is the decisions that you're making. Uh, those are the legal aspects of it. There's also, though, the fact of day-to-day -day parenting in two households. How do you make those decisions, like whether or not your 15-year-old can get a tattoo, right? The law doesn't address that typically, but we try to help parents to continue to work together as parents even as their relationship is ending. We'll talk about that. On the money end of things, there are three uh, legal issues that uh, may or may not be addressed in mediation. Some mediation, called custody mediation, just addresses the child-focused part of the agreement. More comprehensive mediation, or what's sometimes called divorce mediation, also addresses the money issues. Those are involve child support, which is support that's paid from one parent to the other for the support of the children. But in order to support a child in another home, you also need to, that part of that money goes to that other parent's support. There's alimony, or sometimes called spousal support. That's an income transfer that goes to support the spouse. Um, and then uh, there's property division. That's dividing up the things that you own. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about the financial aspects of divorce, but you need to at least be aware of them because Financial issues are oftentimes tied up with children's issues as well. If you have custody of, the, of a child or if you, the child is with you most of the time, you're more likely to receive support. If you own a home, there may be a tendency for one to keep the child in the home. So property division might come into play as well. If you've been in a longer term marriage, that's when spousal support is more likely to come up. Again, we'll talk, this is just a very brief introduction. We'll talk more about this. Uh, a mediator facilitates, a mediator does not decide. Um, my, what I am mediating, um, I have no authority. I guarantee, and most mediators guarantee confidentiality of the process. There's, there's exceptions to that that I'll, we'll talk about in a second. But my sole power when I'm sitting down with two divorcing parents in the room is to bring them to an agreement on their own that they enter into voluntarily. 
um, usually with the outside review and support of independent attorneys as well. Um, mediators in their style, just like psychologists differ in their styles, some mediators are more um, uh, reflective, more Rogerian for the mental health professionals. That's oftentimes referred to as uh, facilitative mediation, uh, just using a lot of reflection, encouraging the parties to talk themselves, not guiding them a lot. Others are what's sometimes called more evaluative. The mediators are more directive, they'll make suggestions, and so on. My personal style tends to mix the two. I, I try to facilitate, but with 30 years of experience, I'm not shy about giving advice and recommendations and, uh, and sharing uh, ideas. But again, it's only advice and recommendations. It's not in, in order. Um, lawyers who mediate tend to be more directive, consistent with their training. Psychologists, mental health professionals tend to be more facilitative. There are techniques, uh, and I do do this some as well, where in fact you have not just the ability to facilitate the, the negotiation, but you might have quasi-judicial authority or you become an arbiter. If the uh, people that I'm working with cannot reach an agreement when I'm doing something other than mediation, I might then have say, okay, you can't reach an agreement, here's what's going to happen. Um, that's called a new, another term, I'm not going to talk about it, but you should be aware of it, called parenting coordination. A parenting coordination is, coordinator is a med-arb role. First you try to mediate, if the people can't mediate, you become an arbiter. This has grown a lot around the country, it's a newer concept, and we'll, we'll see where it fits in in just a second. Uh, as I mentioned, in general, mediation is confidential. Um, I, if people can't reach an agreement in mediation, <clears throat> the matter goes before a judge, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm not going to show up and uh, give testimony. I'm not going to make a recommendation to the judge. I'm not going to move on to perform a, a custody evaluation. In fact, in some states, I'm not sure about Florida law, but in Virginia, for example, if parents, you're seeing parents in therapy and they have a custody dispute, therapy is not confidential. You can be compelled to testify um, as a therapist if you're doing family, family therapy in Virginia, for example. Um, as a mediator in Virginia and in most places, the confidentiality is protected more tightly than even a therapist's role. It's protected more like the confidentiality of a lawyer. Um, there are places in, um, in, in Florida, uh, it's generally a county by county, uh, the, the way uh, mediation is, is run, so there's, it's not uniform statewide. There are places, I'm not sure where in Florida, where mediation is not confidential, where uh, if mediation breaks down, the, the, the mediator will make a recommendation to the court. Um, but when you're doing, when mediation isn't confidential, um, it's really more like that arbitration role again. Because when uh, you say, well, mediation didn't work out, but judge, I think this is the best arrangement for these people, you really become an arbiter. Uh, you're making the decision for them. So really what I focus on and what most mediators focus on is that confidential mediation role that's a pure mediation role. But again, you should be aware of these variations in different jurisdictions. Uh, can vary in terms of how they handle that. Again, mostly it's confidential. California, where mediation started in this country, it's been state law since 1981. San Francisco, San Francisco, mediation is not confidential. LA it is, for example. <clears throat> all of this, all of these kind of legal ground rules we sign off on at the very beginning of mediation. There's an agreement to mediate, and uh, you should have a copy of the agreement to mediate that I use in, in your packet that details the issues about confidentiality, details that pe your parties are encouraged to um, seek legal advice, details some of the limits on confidentiality. For example, child abuse reporting is, is not confidential. Again, we're still compelled to um, uh, make a report when child abuse is suspected. Um, the goal of mediation, again, on the legal end, is to develop a memorandum of understanding, which can become the basis of a separation agreement, a divorce settlement. Um, I urge always, and mediators should urge parties to get legal advice to review this. Of course, as we'll see, many people who are splitting up, whether they're married or not, don't have a lot of money, they can't afford lawyers, um, and that becomes a big issue. A pro se divorce is very common. Why do this? Uh, there are two broad reasons. First of all, custody actions are the most common source of legal action in the United States today. Courts are clogged with custody because of the explosion in divorce and uh, out-of-wedlock uh, birth. Um, and 
the idea of mediation is to give, from a legal perspective, to give parents a voice in the process of making decisions that are hugely important to them. But you know, what's more important to you than the, <coughs> your, your money and especially your children? From the perspective of children, the, uh, the broad rationale is mediation can, as we'll demonstrate, does um, help children. Right? Uh, there's all sorts of evidence that what um, best predicts positive outcomes for children in a divorce are things like the absence of conflict between parents, or at least the absence of conflict around you, having a good relationship with at least one parent, and hopefully a good relationship with both of your parents. <clears throat> and as I'll talk in this opening part of the uh, of my presentation. Uh, I'll show you in my randomized trials that, in fact, mediation does produce those benefits even 12 years after uh, the disputes. Here is just to give you a, a little bit of the landscape of where mediation falls in all of this. There are um, many different ways to work with divorce disputes, right? Again, because this is the biggest category of legal action. Courts are clogged. Let's try to keep these cases out of court. Uh, more and more people recognize that if parents can work out these issues themselves, it's better for them, it's going to be better for children, it's, it's going to be better for their family. Right? Families living apart is still a family. Um, I mentioned briefly pro se divorce or negotiating at the kitchen table. Really about uh, half of all people who split up work things out themselves. Um, there is divorce education. I believe divorce education is mandatory in uh, Florida. It is in many states. If before you can go to court with a legal action concerning kids, you need to attend. Sometimes it's a two-hour, sometimes it's a four or six or an eight-hour program. Again, that can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, about mainly about how divorce is going to affect your children. And again, we're using the term divorce, but you don't necessarily need to be married to be in a situation like this. Um, then there's mediation. Uh, collaborative law is a new approach in the law, new meaning 10 or 15 years old in the law. This is where lawyers sign on to an agreement and they say, I'll represent you, but I'm going to settle this out of court. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to work so hard to settle this out of court that we all agree that if I can't, if the lawyers can't settle this out of court, we're not no longer going to represent you. Right? We're not going to represent you in court. You're going to have to get a new lawyer. It's a way for the lawyers and for the parties to have an incentive to negotiate cooperatively. And there's more things involved in that, but that's not what we're talking about. There's typical attorney negotiations. Most cases are settled in this way. Uh, custody evaluations. Um, I don't do custody evaluations. Many people spend a great deal of time evaluating what alternative arrangements are going to be best for kids, and that's the law here. The guiding principle is children's best interests. Some people view those as a form of assessment. I really view those as a form of dispute resolution because Again, the recommendation an evaluator makes is almost like the role of being an arbiter. Judges almost, about 90% of the time, judges follow the recommendations of a neutral, of a neutral custody evaluator. Um, and there's even techniques called early neutral evaluations where you kind of do a mini evaluation. You say, this is what I think would happen if you went to court. Do you want to settle now? Which kind of shows the settlement technique of it. Uh, retired judges will offer mini trials. There's full custody hearings. And then there's this idea of parenting coordination, which I mentioned briefly, which is a mid arb rule. I put it at the bottom of the dispute resolution funnel because parenting coordination is generally for high conflict repeat litigators. So I'm working with uh, a family now where I'm serving, where I started off trying to mediate with them. This, this family has two boys. Um, they've now spent $300,000 in legal bills. They've been to court at least half a dozen times in the last year and a half. Right? Um, they've finally got the financial aspects of their divorce almost worked out, but they continue to fight about their kids. So I've, they, they just can't work it out. So I've gone from the role of working with them, trying to settle things. I still try to help them to settle things like the dad right now wants to change the schedule around a little bit to fit better with, with his work situation. I try to help them to mediate that. If they can't agree on a change, I then make a decision for them. Right? That's the sort of people who are generally working with parenting coordinators, those high-conflict divorces. Uh, those decisions are always subject to appeal. They can bring them uh, back to, to a judge. But until they do and they sign on to this, I'm the judge. Um, and just to bring a little data to this, this is one study, one of the best studies that's been done of divorce disputes in our courts. It was done in a California court. Uh, I've sent, met, since met the judge whose court this was conducted in, 
He trains all the judges in California now, Len Edwards is his name, and just shows you that, in fact, empirically, most divorce disputes are settled in a way that's consistent with that funnel that I just drew, with the wide end, most cases being settled at the wide end of the funnel, and fewer and fewer set, settled at the narrow end. So that in this, half the case is settled with an uncontested divorce, 30% uh, were negotiated with lawyers, another 11% were settled in, in California's mandatory mediation program, um, another 5% were settled after custody evaluation, which is again part of why I look at custody evaluations as a dispute resolution technique, and only 1.5% of cases were actually decided by a judge. Right? So these, I, I sometimes think of these as successive filters to try to get parents to settle disputes on their own, to get cases out of the legal system, all these different techniques. The statistics, courts in our country keep terrible statistics. This is, um, that's just about the best we have. Um, first, I want to get into talking about um, my research on this. So, uh, oh, I guess it was about 20 years ago, uh, I started doing research on mediation. I've been doing this for about 30 years. Um, and I thought, let's study it. Um, I've done one of the few randomized trials of mediation and litigation. In my study, parents petitioned the court for a contested child custody hearing, and I had a judge that would let me randomly assign cases. At the flip of a coin, cases either went into a brand new mediation program, which was, it was the second program that existed in the state of Virginia at the time, or they proceeded through court. So it's a true randomized trial. Um, for those of you who aren't graduate students, um, a randomized trial lets you determine cause and effect. Right? It, it is a true experiment. So when we get to the results of this study, I'll be able to say mediation caused this difference. It's not correlation, it is causation. Uh, really important. Um, also, a, a distinguishing aspect of the study, nobody has done this, we follow these families over the course of 12 years. So we get to answer the question of, when mediation ends, when parents are divorcing, they're going their own ways, mediation doesn't end happily. Those of you who are mediators know that, right? Mediation is, often, if it's successful, it's often very sad at the end because the family has, has split up. Um, but the question is, is that I always say to myself, what I'm doing is I'm helping this family launch a trajectory that's going to have benefits for the parents and for the children down the road. And the 12-year follow-up lets us have a look at whether, in fact, that does happen. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, my study. Again, random assignment. Um, we ran this as an initial study and a replication. So there was a built-in replication in the study. And I'll talk some about other research that's been done on mediation, but I'm going to focus on my own work. That's what I know the best. And there really, again, there haven't been many randomized trials in this area. Um, it's a relatively small study involving uh, about 70 families, um, but we had two kids per family we followed and two parents, and you know, when people split up, they move around too. So we've spent a lot of time tracking people down really all over the country. We looked at how things were going immediately after dispute resolution. We followed them up a year and a half later, and then we followed them up, as I mentioned, 12 years down the road. Everybody in this study was what we call was really a high-conflict divorce, right? Only about 10% of divorcing families with children, and again, not everybody in the study was married, so again, when, when you hear divorce, include the never married as well. Uh, uh, only about 10% of divorcing families with children petitioned for a contested court hearing, right? Those are the, you know, 90% of people, as we saw, are able to work things out out of court. So this is like the 10% uh, most difficult cases. The sample was a low-income sample. The average income was about $20,000 per family. Um, it was racially diverse, uh, reflecting the, the demographics of Charlottesville, Virginia, which is mainly white and, uh, and black. Um, the mediation intervention, we weren't doing long-term therapy with them. The intervention lasted an average of about three two-hour sessions. I often do mediation in two-hour blocks. Uh, some people will do longer, day-long mediations, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, and uh, the mediation in the study was co-mediation. There were male and female co-mediators working here. Uh, if you're thinking about trying to learn mediation, actually, if you're thinking about trying to learn couples therapy with my graduate students in, in psychology, I often, often encourage them to do co-therapy. Um, it's nice when there's a lot going on in the room to have somebody there to help you along the way. 
Um, it's nice if you're a male and female client coming in to see a man and a woman there, right? Not just a man. Oh, he's on my husband's side, not just a woman. She, he, she's on my wife's side. Um, and uh, again, often sometimes too, uh, lawyers and mental health professionals will work together. My wife is a lawyer. We've done a handful of mediations together as well. Um, in the study, partly for because of my interest, partly because of the jurisdiction of the court, we didn't uh, address uh, property division. We didn't address spousal support or alimony. We did address child support, um, custody or time. Legal, that's physical custody and legal custody or decision making. The t way that I do mediation, I call it emotionally informed mediation. We're not doing therapy, but we're not just doing business, right? We're, we're, we, we do this with a great deal of awareness of the emotional dynamics. Um, that includes educating people about their own emotions, as I'll talk about a lot today. Um, that includes educating uh, uh, parents about parenting and co-parenting. Co-parenting is an important term, how parents work together. Um, hugely important, right? Are you going to have a bedtime at 7 o'clock in one house and 11 o'clock in the other house? Right. Things like that. Um, and I often what I do a lot is use my middle position to try to understand how children are feeling in divorce, right? If, you know, if I have a mom and a dad in the room and I am absolutely jumping out of my skin because they are arguing with each other or just because it's so tense, I have a pretty good idea that maybe this is how their children feel because their children, just like me, just like you as the mediator, is in that middle position. And I'll oftentimes use my own emotional reactions as feedback to parents to point out exactly this, right? You know, is this the way things are going? When, when you do this, I am, you know, I'm jumping out of my skin. I'm afraid that, to say the wrong thing. I wonder, how did Johnny, how did Sally, how do they feel in this situation, right? We need to do something different. We need to do something different in the, this room. And more importantly, you need to do something different outside of this room. Um, I don't get into therapy, but again, that's, we'll use that sort of reflection. It's not just about the business of negotiating a memorandum of understanding. I'm going to go into this a lot more, uh, in a lot more detail as I go through the workshop, but I wanted to give those of you just going to be here for, for the initial research part and also to introduce, you know, what's going on in divorce and, and how are we addressing emotions in mediation? Think about this. I assume that a number of people in this room have once had a relationship, right? Um, you've probably had a relationship where you've gotten dumped. Right? If you think back to your days in high school or college, for example, I will think back to, and I hate to think about this being on the internet, but I'll use her real name. I think back to getting dumped when I was a freshman in high school by a girl by the name of Candy Aiken, right? Beautiful girl. She, in our freshman year, she dumped me for a senior, right? Forty years later, I still haven't gotten over it, Candy. <laughs> <laughs> when Candy dumped me, and I think this is probably true for most of you, I didn't say to her, oh, goody, let's sit down and talk about it. Let's mediate. Right? I said, you no good. And then things maybe I don't want to be live on the internet. A string of swear words. I never want to see you again. That's the normal, the natural, the emotional way to end a relationship. Is I never want to see you again. Right? Um, that's what goes, what goes on in divorce. Right? Parents who are divorcing think they're going to end their relationship the normal, the natural way, the way they've always done it. Except there is a problem if you have kids, and this is the problem. If you are never going to see her again, or you're never going to see him again, that can mean never seeing your children again, right? And here is evidence on how infrequently non-resident Divorced fathers in 1988, actually this is from a paper published in 1991, but I focus on this for a reason, saw, saw their kids after divorce. And you can see here that even um, 
within the first year or two after divorce, about a third of fathers were seeing their kids only a couple times a year to not at all. And as it went out to 11 years after divorce on the far right-hand side, that number grew to about three-quarters of fathers. We're seeing their kids either not at all or only a few times a year. Now, we're going to look at how this has changed and how it hasn't changed over time later on in, in the presentation. Uh, I know that fathers' rights uh, advocates look at this and say, the, the men got pushed out of the kids' lives by, by her, by the court, right? Mother's rights people look at this and say, he was a deadbeat to begin with. He dropped out of the kids' lives. He was not going to pay support. I look at this and say, um, these dads ended relationships the natural way. They said, I never want to see you again. And that meant not seeing their kids very much either. Um, that's my interpretation. I'm also going to show you how this picture changes if you mediate instead of litigate. Right? From a psychological perspective, mediation is all about doing something that's emotionally unnatural. It's ending relationship in a different way. It's not saying, I'm never going to see you again. It's saying, emotionally, I want to say that to you, but I'm going to love our kids more than I might hate you. Right? That's a big emotional trip. A big emotional trip. Um, just another common sense example. Again, this is one that I'll delve into. Not surprisingly, when you find out that your husband is having an affair with somebody else or your wife, people tend to get angry. Anybody surprised by that? Right? Tend to get angry. Um, and there's lots of good, logical, rational reasons to be angry in divorce. There are also lots of good emotional reasons to be angry in divorce. And let me just give you one from a common sense perspective. Has anybody, this might have happened to somebody last night, has anybody ever gotten up in the middle of the night to try to find their way to the bathroom and you stub your toe on a table or a chair? Right? What do you do? You curse it out. Yeah. You stupid table! Right? Yeah. Here you are in your underwear. In the middle of the night, yelling at a table. Please explain to me logically why you're doing that. Right. There is no logical reason, right? You're acting angry. You're threatening the table. And what might you do? Well, really, I kick it again. Boy, you've really taught that table a lesson, haven't you? Ow, 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 right? You're acting angry. How do you really feel? Hurt. Many people when they're into the mediator's office, are acting angry. And how they really feel mm -hmm. is hurt. Right? I'll talk much more about this later on as the workshop goes on. If we can get from the anger to the hurt and pain, there's a lot more opportunity to move things forward. Right. For this beginning, that's the basics. We'll get into here in much more detail later on. Um, in doing mediation, in the kind of the how-to-do of mediation, um, there's kind of two broad themes in the way that I do it. One is uh, dealing with this underlying emotions, right? I can remember early on, if I can borrow a pen for just a second, early on when I first started doing mediation, I had a couple, it was, this was done in the court in Charlottesville, it was right above the chief judge's chambers, the guy who let me randomly assign cases, and I had this couple, and for like, the, for like four hours, they sat in this chamber and they picked up the pencils that I had. I had pencils and pads for them to talk logically and brainstorm about what to do with their kids. And they picked up their pencils and they waved them in each other's faces and they shouted at each other. And I'm there like, what am I doing? <laughs> I have no idea what's going on, you know, um, until I finally said, hey, wait a minute. You guys are having fun, aren't you? And they looked at me, and they looked at each other. This was a couple who'd already been divorced, and they had a, this was a di dispute years after, and they said, yeah, this feels just like what it was like when we were married, right? <laughs> they were using their anger to be connected with each other, right? So sometimes we get to the hurt under the anger. Sometimes we get to that longing for connection. We'll talk a lot about that, too, right? Quick for now, what's the opposite of love? Apathy. Who said that? 
go to the head of the class, right? <laughs> Apathy. Hate is not the opposite of love. Hate is very engaging. Love and hate are not far apart, as the saying goes. Thank you. So that's one quick example of what we do, right? Another quick example is brainstorming. This is a familiar psychological technique, again, that I'll go into in some detail later on. I hope to role play a, a, a nice brainstorming example for you. But brainstorming basically is kind of an anything goes idea. And I can't tell you how many times in the middle of this tense mediation, when we're saying, let's come up with lots of, how can we solve this complex problem, how to raise your kids across two households? What do you think I hear over and over again? Well, we could get back together. Back together? Are you kidding? He said I could say anything, right? But people in, when you give them permission to say anything, anything crazy, and we'll get to this, people will reveal that longing that's still there. It comes up a lot. So, did it work? So again, back in the study, um, we flipped the coin. Heads, you go to mediation. Tails, you continue on to court, the court hearing as you want. Um, did we settle any cases? Well, if you mediated about, we settled about 75% of the cases in, who came to mediation. That's in blue on the far right. About half of the ones that remained, about another 12% or so, the lawyer settled. After mediation didn't work out, but the lawyer settled, it kept it out of court. And sometimes that's the outcome of mediation, is you, you don't settle all the issues, but you narrow the issues. You get people ready to, to settle. Only about 15% of cases actually appeared in front of a judge. If the coin came up tails and you went to court, again, at random, 75% of those cases appeared in front of the judge. Okay. This is not, I mean, that outcome is not just statistically significant. Um, that passes a, a statistical test that Dave Cross, who used to teach uh, statistics at Stony Brook, uh, would call the interocular trauma test. Right? Those are results that are so big that they hit you right between the eyes. Interocular trauma test, right? Lots of people are kept out of court. And this is a good thing from the perspective of judges, right? And as we'll see, it's a good thing for families too. Um, did we reach, what do the, our agreements look like? The, the, the quick punchline, there's two quick punchlines. Uh, I don't won't go into the agreements in great detail. Uh, two things are about our agreements. The agreements we reached in mediation did not look much different from the agreements that were reached in court. Um, the one thing that was different, it was, there was more joint legal custody in the mediated agreements. When this study was done in the late 1980s, joint legal custody was a really new and kind of radical idea. There was no legislation in Virginia that spelled out what joint legal custody was. But like lots of things in divorce, uh, having joint custody was symbolically important, particularly to the dads uh, in, in here. And it's true, it was true then, and it's tr still true now. A lot of times, people who do mediation are looking, thinking out of the box. They're not just acting the way, staying within the legal box. They're inventing new terms or not using terms at all that, that, uh, that parents can relate to much more. So they'll talk about things like parenting plans or just decision making and time as opposed to these custody labels. Um, the other thing is that to keep in mind is a, is a broad summary of what our arrangements looked like back then is they looked more traditional in the sense that both after litigation and, a, and after mediation, most of the kids spent most of their times mostly with their, with their mothers. <clears throat> Again, things have changed. We'll look at this in the next segment, how much things have changed and how much they haven't changed really over time. Uh, but certainly, if we were to do that study today, children would be spending more time with their dads, both following litigation and following mediation. So, so keep that in mind. Other research shows that our rate of getting agreement is was a little bit on the high end, but it's typical. Um, generally, mediation programs from across the United States and across the world find about somewhere between 40 and 80 percent of their cases settled. Okay. This, by the way, you should know just as a backdrop, mediation is the law in many states, again, in, in Florida on a county by county basis, places like California since 1981 and in many countries. So in Australia, mediation is nationwide in Australia, for example. Um, and I've been lucky enough to, to go to Australia many times to talk about it. Um, you also should know, though, 
that some courts, particularly in small jurisdictions that don't have a lot of resources, offer mediation that isn't mediation. Um, a small, this will happen a lot, in, again, in rural courts that don't have a lot of support. They'll get a probation officer who doesn't have any training working with families, doesn't have any training in mediation, and the judge will say, okay, you're my mediator. I'm going to give you a half hour to work with the families that come through the court to, to settle these cases. Not surprisingly, those programs are not terribly successful, and they don't get a very good reputation. Right? Mediation needs to involve, needs to have some support from the court. It needs to involve some degree, at least some degree of training, uh, some degree of support, and some amount of time, not an hour. Right? Because it's all about helping parents to reach good decisions, not just keeping cases out of courts, not just getting agreements. Um, in the uh, one and a half year follow up, we asked about um, satisfaction with the process for uh, parents um, on a number of dimensions. Some dimensions reflected what we thought would happen um, better for the litigation group. Like, litigation is all about protecting your rights, right? That's not what mediation isn't about rights talk. Uh, but we actually found that um, the women who went through court, they were happy that their rights were protected over on the far right-hand side. The women who went through mediation in red on the far right, they were happy. They felt their rights were protected. The men who went through mediation felt that their rights were protected as well, looking on the left, the red on the left. Um, but the blue on the left, the men who went through court felt, to coin a term, like they'd been screwed like their rights weren't protected. Take a look at this pattern because it's quite constant. Um, do you feel uh, rights were protected? Do you feel like the process settled problems? Women, whether they went through mediation or not, felt it settled problems. Men, if they went through mediation, felt like it settled problems. Men who went through court didn't feel like it helped. Do you think people were concerned for you? Women who went through mediation or litigation thought concern was shown for them. Men who went through mediation thought concern was shown for them. Men who went through court didn't. Concern shown for the kids, same story. There was one outcome, though, that was different. Do you feel like you won what you wanted? Um, in this case, the women who went through mediation felt significantly more like they won what they wanted. And I, I uh, the very first paper I published from this was picked up in the late 80s by on by several feminist law professors who were taking the mother's rights perspective at this time, which was stronger than now father's rights perspective tends to dominate, um, and said, aha, I knew it all along. Mediation is bad for women, right? You win more if you go to court. We need to go to court and fight out our rights for, for women. Where, in, again, in the 80s, particularly in Virginia, women were winning in court, including in, in my sample. Um, however, there's another way you could look at this, if you look at this a little more carefully. You could look at the blue. The women over here in blue went to court. They look like they're winning a lot. The men who went to court looks like they're not winning much at all. But if you look at the two reds, Men and women who went to mediation, they look like they're pretty similar in terms of what they're feeling. Looks kind of looks like compromise. Uh, a slogan in the mediation area is also that mediation is a, produces win-win outcomes as opposed to win-lose outcomes. And you could look at this that way. And in fact, if you correlate, if you simply look at the correspondence between mother scores and father scores in mediation and in litigation, that's exactly what you find. In, media, in court, the more a mother said she won, the less the father said that he, he won. It's a win-lose proposition. That's what court's all about. But in mediation, it was actually the opposite. The more a mom said she won, the more the dad said he won too. Win-win. That's what mediation's all about. Now, that's shortly after the dispute resolution. Um, oh, okay. I, just real, real quickly. The question is, what happened down the road? Before telling you what happened down the road in my study, uh, let me say that um, other lots of other research, again, even in big programs like California, a few other randomized trials. Joan Kelly's done some nice work in this area. Uh, Jen McIntosh, which I'll talk a little bit, has done work in Australia. People generally like mediation better. 
than the adversary process. Um, and there is some evidence to, to suggest as well that people are more likely to follow through with an agreement that they work out their own versus one that's imposed on them by the court. Um, in my study, they were more likely to, to pay child support, for example. Um, one thing I want to mention, though, and we'll see this in a second, coming back to your mediator because things have changed, that's not a failure. That's a good thing, right? If you're trying to decide what parenting arrangement is best for a two-year-old, do you want to keep that same plan that you arrange when the child's two for the next 16 years? Or do you want that plan to grow and change along with your child? I think it should grow and change. I think it should adapt. I think it should be what I call a living agreement. And I encourage people to do that. And I encourage them to come back and work it out in mediation when it's appropriate. Yeah. Oh, the child's now in preschool. Here's a different thing. Starting school, here's a different thing. Dad's had to move away for a job. Here's a different thing, right? We need to plan for changes rather than have something that's fixed. Um, so some change is good, <coughs> not bad. Let me get to what happened 12 years later, which is, as I mentioned before, I like to think when mediation ends that I've planted a seed, right? Rare, it just doesn't happen when I work out a beautiful parenting plan. We worked out a schedule for mom and dad to divorce with, without a lot of acrimony, for kids to both spend time with their parents according to some schedule. When mediation ends at that point, when it was successful, Nobody's giving me high fives. Nobody's saying, hey, thanks, Emery. What a great divorce we just had. Let's do it again. <laughs> right? Um, it's sad. People are still hurt and angry. Right? We don't work all that out. The question is, though, is do we set them off on a different trajectory? Um, and that's why I wanted to do this long-term follow-up. And the answer is yes. So... Um, here is one outcome. Again, coin came up heads, you went to mediation. Tails, you went to litigation. Twelve years later, if the coin came up uh, heads and you went to mediation, twelve years later, about 25% of non-residential parents, mostly but not exclusively dads, were still seeing their child one time a week or more, compared to 7% if the coin came up tails and you went to litigation. We tripled the rate of weekly contact between non-residential parents and their kids. That uh, bar in orange is just the data from that national sample from a comparable period of time that I showed you uh, just a second ago from how often nationally people, fathers were seeing their kids 11 years after divorce. Um, at the opposite end here, if the coin came up heads and you went to mediation, only about, and I say only, this is still a lot, but only about 20% of fathers were seeing their children one time a year or less 12 years later. Um, that compared to about 40% if the coin came up tails and you went to court. I mean, we have all kinds of programs designed to promote and encourage fathers' relationships with their children after divorce. Um, Six hours of mediation was tripling the rate of weekly contact and having the rate of essentially dropout of the kids 12 years later. I think that's a pretty good payoff on six hours investment of your time. Right? Um, now, of course, as kids grow older, time passes as kids grow older. Some dads are moving away. Some kids are moving away. Kids are going off to school and living on their own. So seeing your child face to face is, uh, harder. So we asked about telephone contact as well. Um, this was in the pre-texting uh, email days, so it was just <laughs> telephone contact. Um, but now the numbers are truly big. If the coin came up heads, you went to mediation. Twelve years later, six hours of mediation, half of those non-residential parents were talking uh, on their phone to their child every week. Every week compared to about 10% if the coin came up tails and you proceeded to went to court. All right. Five times the rate. And again, there are some parents who are non-residential parents who aren't talking with their kids hardly at all, but much, much lower 
than those who went to court. So non-residential, again, mostly fathers stayed much more involved with their kids uh, 12 years later, six hours of mediation. Not only were they more involved, but they were better parents. According to who? Not according to their own ratings, but according to their ex-wives or ex-spouses rating. We asked um, the residential parent, and again, these were mostly traditional arrangements from the time, rate your ex in terms of these qualities. On every single one of those items uh, summarized in red, if the coin came up heads, the, not, the residential parent rated the non-residential parent better. They said he's been a better disciplinarian, he's been better at dressing and grooming the kids, better at religious and uh, moral upbringing, better running errands, better at celebrating holidays, better at significant events in the kids' lives, better taking him to school and church, better at participating in recreation with them, better at discussing problems with me, and better at taking the kids on vacation as well. Let me pose a question. Amazing or duh, as my kids would say. Duh, dad. Duh. Right? You know, on the one hand, I think these results are amazing. Six hours. Come on. There's some clinical psychology graduate students here, I'm assuming, in the room. What, th what therapy, six hours of what therapy, 12 years later, gives you not just statistically significant outcomes, but socially significant differences. Can you name one? Right. From that perspective, six hours, five times the rate of weekly telephone contact 12 years later? That is like amazing. Right. And sometimes I look at the study and I think amazing. Other times I think, duh, right? duh. If your goal is like mine is, is for even in divorce, for as much as possible, and not necessarily 50-50, we'll, we'll get into this, but as much as possible in a practical way, for kids to still have two parents in their lives? What's a better way to start this off? To say, oh, okay, let's go into court and drag out every little rotten thing I can find about you, right? Including the things we thought were secret, like, oh, see these pictures of her I have on my phone? You want her to be the mother of this, these kids, right? You don't think this happens? All the time this happens, right? Um, or do you say, look, I know you're hurt. I know you're in pain. This is probably the hardest thing that you're ever going to go through. But there's somebody else here who's hurting and in pain. And we have to put that other person's needs, number one, and that happens to be your children. Let's find a way to do it. And from that perspective, it's a duh. It's a thought. Of course, of course, this leads to uh, better long-term outcomes. The logical explanation, alternative explanation, is that mediation doesn't do anybody any good, right? But what happens is going to court and look, looking at this is so bad that that causes negative outcomes, right? And so maybe the, what re mediation really does is prevent something really bad from happening. So. It, either one of those explanations. Something, though, is causing it. Either court, and I, in our best evidence is that it's some combination of two. The court makes things worse and mediation makes things better. So, um, and there's other things that it makes better. Uh, even though there's more chances for us to fight. Why? Because we're both seeing our kids, right? That gives us lots of opportunity to fight. And believe me, if you work in this area, you know that lots of people fight around exchanges. And I often tell people, what do you talk about when you exchange? Well, that's the time I've got to talk with her about the child support check. Or that's the time I've got to say that you're doing the wrong parenting. And I say, no. What you talk about during exchanges is the weather. Oh, cloudy again today. Oh, a lot warmer than it was last week. <laughs> Great topic around the kids, right? Because we don't want you fighting around the kids. Lots of people don't do that. But in fact, so when you're exchanging the kids in mediation, there's more opportunities to fight. Actually, though, the people who mediated fought less, right? Um, uh, there was one negative outcome associated with mediation. We had parents rate their ambivalence about ending the relationship. Twelve years later, people who mediated said they were more uncertain whether this getting divorced had been a good thing in the first place. Um, 
And um, that may be because we didn't let them be as angry. Anger helps people to deal with their hurt. It also could be that over the course of 12 years, they were working together as parents, and they said to themselves, well, maybe he wasn't such a jerk after all, right? But in every case, they express more ambivalence down the road. Um, as I suggested, we found that mediation led to more changes in children's living arrangement over the course of 12 years, but on average, there was only one change, right? And if you think about that, during the course of a kid's life, in 12 years, I mean, how many families move? one time, make a major change in a child's residence, you know, intact families, two-parent families. Um, in litigation, nobody made a change, right? It's like, uh-uh, I'm not going there again, right? Um, they didn't adapt. Whatever it was at two, it was still there at 20, or actually not 20, at 14. Um, again, I think changes are uh, a good thing. We didn't find, honestly, I was hoping to find this, I was expecting to find this, we didn't find differences now in the late adolescents, young adults' mental health. We didn't find differences in the mental health of children on average. Although the difference, the, the differences that were there, though not statistically significant, all favored the kids in the mediation group, right? All favored the kids in the mediation group. And if you did a trick, which you can't do technically, there were four or five families in the mediation group who changed arrangements like four or five times during the course of that 12 years. It's almost like they took the message of mediation too literally. If you took those families out of the group, the differences now favored the, the mediation group statistically significantly, but then you wreck your random assignment when you do that. So you can't do that. Only do that. That's kind of an exploratory analysis. One, one more thing I want to say, and then I'll, I'll get to your question. What we also did find, though, and this is a paper we're working on right now, again, the, the basic comparisons, there's no difference. But it's interesting. Um, lack of conflict, more involvement, better parenting, those are all things that predict child adjustment better in divorce. We produced all those outcomes in mediation. Why didn't we find statistically significant differences for the children? Maybe a power issue. We were underpowered in the study. That, that could be the, the problem. Uh, but I think it's really this. There's, and this is the paper we're working on. There's two ways for people to end conflict in divorce. There's the normal and the natural way. I'm never going to see you again, which happened in the litigation group. There's the unnatural way. Let's love our kids more than we hate each other. Let's work together. In the mediation group, parents' conflict, quality of parenting, all those things we expect predicted children's well-being 12 years later. In the litigation group, it didn't matter if you still hated each other because one of you wasn't seeing the kids. So the process, family relationships, predicted child outcome 12 years later in the mediation group. It didn't predict child outcome in the litigation group. One process preserved a family. Another process ended a family is what that looks like to me. Let me quickly tick through these. Um, there's no other long-term studies to compare to this. Uh, you should know Jen McIntosh in Australia, a good friend of mine, has done research on mediation Different styles of mediation, this is what, where we need research to go, different types of mediation. She's done comparing um, what she calls child-inclusive uh, mediation versus child-focused mediation. Child-focused mediation is, is like what I've been talking about. Child-inclusive mediation, a mental health professional interviews the child and uses that interview not to make a custody evaluation, but to make recommendations to the parents about what the child is expressing. She's finding that that child-inclusive process, which as you can well imagine is a very delicate process, is producing better outcomes than mediation where kids are not involved. Um, uh, there's people at Indiana University who are working to uh, replicate Jen's research on this right now. Um, but the big issue is we need more research uh, on mediation. And we need, if anybody out there is listening, we need somebody with a lot of money to fund research in this area. The federal government doesn't fund research in this area. Um, the last questions I want to ask you uh, to leave you with is, why did so little mean so much, right? Um, I think part of the reason why so, so such a little intervention meant so much is that timing is everything, and this is the right time, right? The older I get, the more I realize there's just a handful of choice points in your life, right? Who you choose to partner and have kids with, that's a big choice point. How you handle the breakup of your parenting relationship is another huge choice point. People who mediated took a different path. Um, 
it's not so much just the decisions that were reached, but it's how you reach them. It's having a voice in the process. It's owning your decision. It's taking the long view. It's thinking about your time with your kids, not just in terms of hours and days, but in terms of years. Right? How are things going to unfold over time? It's about realizing that that person you had a child with is always going to be there, a part of your child's life, and that through your child, always a part of your life. Um, it's also, I think, part of the reason why so little met so much in my study is uh, had to do with our uh, commitment and enthusiasm, something that uh, the clinical psychology students probably know of as the allegiance effect. We believed in mediation, and our belief and our commitment and our enthusiasm um, was part of what made mediation work. Um, that technically, that is a problem. Practically, it is. I mean, those of us who work with divorcing families know that this is hard work. This is hard work. People are angry. People aren't doing, spending a lot of time thanking you. I get emails. I've gotten many emails on this trip from my clients. I don't from my therapy clients. My mediation clients, I get from them all the time. Part of what makes this work, parts of what makes it successful, is being committed to saying, look, if people are going to break up as much as they do in our country, if parents are going to break up as much as they do in our country now, we need to help them find a better way. We need to be committed. We need to get renewed and re-energized and go back on Monday morning and give it 100% because we need to make this a mission. And making it a mission is part of what makes us better. Technically, it's a problem. Practically, I think it's what it's all about. It's why I got into this field to begin with. Um, it's emotionally wrong for parents, but for us, it's the right thing to do. And if you think I've been making this up, here are the <laughs> papers that have been published for a long time. 